thank you for joining me for another edition of Rivers of Living Water. You can get information about this ministry at abidinglife.net. At our website, you can get information about the church, the media ministry, the outreach ministries, the missions outreach, and various coming events. Feel free to send me an email, pastor at abidinglife.net. Hi, I'm Pastor Ken Miller, and I'd like to invite you to Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church. We are a growing spirit-filled congregation here in Sterling, Virginia, boldly proclaiming God's glorious gospel of grace, the finished work of the cross, and Christ's overwhelming love for you. More information is available at abidinglife.net. Come experience the power of God's word at Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church. Amen. Heavenly Father, we receive that blessing. We thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us in our coming and in our going, in our families, our children and their children. Thank you, Lord, that you have promised an abundance of blessings, and we just thank you, Lord, for that, Lord. And I just submit the rest of this service into your hands, Lord. I ask you to have your way. Help me to minister by the anointing of the Spirit of God. I just ask you, Lord, to help me to be led by the Spirit. Help me to speak by the Spirit and not by the flesh. And I just ask you, Lord, that each person receive what you intend for them to receive, Lord Jesus. Let every person receive what the Spirit is saying to the church this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Well, welcome. Well, originally, as most of you know, we had a guest speaker scheduled for this weekend, but he wasn't able to make it. So we still had the healing service, and I prepared a message for that. And this, really, this morning is kind of a part two to what I shared yesterday. So I want to share with you about the healing promise this morning. And... The, the origins of this message comes from decades ago. I was, I was a spirit-filled Christian as a teenager, so I started as a teenager. Um, do any of you remember Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowships? <laughs> they, they, it used to be a major movement, and in every major city, there was a Full Gospel Businessmen's chapter, and they would have monthly meetings. And where I lived in a small town in central Illinois, um, I was kind of, there was kind of a triangle of cities, Bloomington, Champaign, and Decatur. The small town that I lived in was right in the middle of that triangle. And so each of these major cities had, or fairly major cities, they had a full gospel businessmen's fellowship one Saturday a month, and they were different Saturdays. So I was able to go to three different full gospel businessmen's fellowships as a teenager, and these were spirit-filled gatherings where a lot of, they would have guest speakers, they would always have guest speakers, and the speakers were frequently talking about healing. They weren't always talking about healing, but frequently they were. And a lot of times they were testimonies. People were sharing their testimonies on, on how they got saved or how they got spirit-baptized or how they received their healing. And I found these meetings exciting, and I went to them frequently, but I... I, I knew other people who were not spirit-filled who would tell you things like, well, sometimes God heals and sometimes he doesn't. You know, So it's great that they receive their healing, but they, they need to be careful how they share it because other people are going to expect God to heal them, and he may not. In other words, there's a lot of people out there, a lot of religious, well-meaning people that will throw cold water on your faith. <laughs> so I, I was young, and I didn't know everything. I probably thought I did, but I, like most teenagers, but... But I wasn't satisfied with what I was hearing, and, and, but I took into consideration because I, I wanted to be accurate in my theology. I didn't want to be promoting a lie. I wanted to be accurate in my theology. So I decided, well, I had a big question. Just because you received your healing, how do, how do I know that that means I need a healing? And I wasn't really facing any major sickness. I had asthma as a teenager, but nothing really major. But how, how, how do I know that it's always God's will to heal? And people would show, people would preach on different stories in the Bible about people receiving healing, and they would give their own testimony about them receiving healing. But how do I know just because you received your healing or just because blind Bartimaeus received his healing, how does that prove to me that it's God's will to heal me? And I don't know if you've ever had that question I know that a lot of people in the religious 
mainstream churches don't believe that it's always God's, God's will to heal. And sometimes, like when my, my wife passed away nine and a half years ago, people, people said things like, well, it must have been her time to go. And that's nonsense. <laughs> God promised a long life, and 53 is not a long life. And people will point at other people that didn't receive their healing and say, well, if it was always God's will to heal, why didn't they receive their healing? And there are reasons for that. That's not the point, the point of today's sermon. But what I want to convey to you is the fact, according to the Bible, it is always God's will to heal you. Because that's what I wasn't receiving at that, at that time. Again, I was hearing all kinds of testimonies. But I think it's dangerous to build your theology on a testimony. It's dangerous to build your faith or your theology on somebody else's experience. Do you know what I mean? I wanted my faith to be in the Word of God. So I wanted to know that I know that I know that the Bible tells me that I can be healed. That's where I was at. And nobody was preaching that, so I decided to preach it myself. So, <laughs> But let's begin with this verse. This is something I've shared a couple of times with you recently, but I think this is a very important place to start. I've shared verse 20 with you, but I want, I want you to see it in the context, beginning in verse 18. But as God is true, our word toward you was not yea and nay. Notice, this is Paul saying, we're not telling you yes and no, we're telling you yes. I know there's a lot of people, a lot of churches out there that'll say, sometimes God says yes and sometimes God says no. Paul is saying, we're not saying yes and no. Verse 19, he says, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, was preaching among you, who was, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay. It was not yes and no. We're not telling you yes and no. <laughs> and, no and then verse 20, all the promises of God in him are yea. In other words, yes. All the promises are yes. Now, the, those two words in him are very important. All the promises of God in Jesus are yes. And in Jesus, amen, to the glory of God. So, how many of you are in Jesus? I see most of you putting your hands up. <laughs> if you're in Christ, all the promises are yes. He's not going to say no. All the promises are yes. So if you're in him, you qualify for all his promises. So then the next question is, well, what are his promises? And that's what I'm going to get to. I'm going to, not going to, of course, not share all the promises, but I'm going to focus on the healing promise today. So I, I shared, I think last, I think it was last Sunday when I shared the NIV version of this, but I want you to see the English Standard Version of verse 20. All the promises of God find their yes in him, in Jesus. So if you're in Jesus, all the promises are yes. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to the glory of God. Remember, I share the NIV where it says the amen is spoken by us and the ESV that the English Standard Version is saying basically the same thing. He says, yes, we utter our amen. So in other words, this is telling us we have to be in agreement. The word amen, which was a prominent word in that last song that Ramah sang, amen means so be it. So when you sing amen, when you say amen, you're not saying the end, right? We say amen at the end of our prayers. We're not, it doesn't mean the end. It means so be it. In other words, you're placing yourself in agreement with what's being said. So when he says yes and we utter our amen, that's saying I agree with what he's saying. I agree that the promises are for me. I agree because I'm in him and he's saying yes, I place myself in agreement. And this is, I think, where a lot of Christians miss it. They get prayed for it and then they have the attitude, well, let's see what happens. Right? Isn't that the attitude many people have? We'll, we'll see what happens. Or they might come to an, an altar call just to see what happens or just to see if they receive. If you have that type of attitude, it's like you're not fully in agreement with it. And he's telling you here, you need to place your amen. You need to say amen. You need to say, so be it. Or it is true. I'm putting myself in full agreement. And you can do that because... It tells us in Numbers, verse tw chapter 23, verse 19, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? 
So if God is not a man that he would lie, that means if you find the promise, you can utter your amen in agreement with it, right? This is just an introduction. I haven't gotten to the promises yet, but I just want to make sure that you know that you know that you know that you can agree with God. <laughs> so if God promised it to you, it's yours. You don't have to question, is this God's will for me? It is his will for you. And you might think, well, you know, some people might think, well, I'm spending too much time talking about healing. There's so many other things in the Bible. Yes, and we talk about those too. But, but healing is something that sicknesses and de diseases and pains are something that each one of us have experienced at least to some degree, right? <laughs> and so often I think we suffer more than what we have to because he has said you're healed and you just need, we need to put our faith in agreement with what he said. And here's two more scriptures just to confirm that previous verse because out of the mouth of two or three witnesses let every word be established. It says, God forbid, yea, let God be true and every man a liar. So if there's anything that anybody says to you that's contrary to what God says, who are you going to agree with? Who's telling the truth and who's the liar? <laughs> you know, and again, I don't want you to tell your doctor he's a liar necessarily, but if he's telling you something that disagrees with what God says, maybe under your breath say that's a lie. I'm agreeing with what God says, not what the doctor says. Amen. I hope you agree with that. And in Titus, in hope, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. I just want to emphasize these things that God is telling you the truth. Men that tell you things contrary to God, they're lying. <laughs> and here it says God that cannot lie. God cannot lie. It's impossible for him to lie. He cannot lie. So, you know, your body is the temple of God. If your faith is in Jesus, if you've invited him to be your Lord and Savior, your body is his temple. He lives in you. So, of course, he is interested in your health. This idea that so many religious people have that some people God will heal and some people he won't, or he, it's his will for some people to suffer for his name's sake or whatever, that's not true. You are God's temple. He doesn't want your, his temple to be suffering. All right, you are his temple. You need to see this. You need to see yourself that your body is of his highest concern because your body is his temple and he wants it well. So what I did is I went through the Bible. This is just an introduction so far, but I went through the Bible. I did this decades ago. Well, at least a couple of years ago when I was a teenager, but I, I was, I, pardon a couple of years ago, yes, when when I wasn't being satisfied with the sermons that I was hearing because I was hearing a lot, of, like I said, I was hearing a lot of sermons on testimonies because God healed me, he'll heal you also. Well, that just didn't satisfy me. I wanted a promise from God directly. And people would take me to all kinds of different stories in the Bible, this healing and that healing. But still, just because somebody else was healed, how do I know it's for me? Well, I found, I found a lot of scriptures, a lot more than what I thought I would, and, and I'm, I may not get through them all, but I have a lot here, <laughs> and we'll see how far I get. But the first part, I want to share with you healing promises from the Old Testament, and the New Testament says we have the better covenant, right? So if it was true in the Old Testament, it's certainly true in the New Testament. I have three parts to my sermon if I get through it all. Healing promises from the Old Testament, healing promises from the New Testament, and then I want to share with you promises for longevity. Not only does he want you healthy, he wants you to live a long life. And I don't, I don't see anybody here that's lived a long life. Well, some more than others, but, <laughs> but I believe he wants you, how long is long, what might be the question. Well, in, in, I don't know if this is one of my verses up there or not, but in, it probably is. In Psalm 91, 16, it says he'll satisfy you with a long life. So if you're not satisfied, it's not long yet. Okay. So, but anyway, let's, let's take a look at a few of these. The very, the very first place in the Bible that promises healing is in Exodus 15, 26. There, now there are some examples of healing. There are some healing stories in the book of Genesis, but the first one that I found that can be taken as a promise 
is Exodus 15, 26, where he says, I am the Lord that heals you. This is where we get the, the, the covenant name of God, Jehovah Rapha, which you might have heard of before, which is the Lord, it's translated here, the Lord that heals thee. Now, you, if you know the context of this, and one problem that people have, or you might have, and I used to have, <laughs> in, in, in some of these problems, or, or some of these promises, in, fa in fact, most of them, there are conditions. Somebody told me once that the biggest word in the Bible is the word if. Because in front of all these promises, frequently there is an if. If you do this, if you obey all my commandments. And if you look at that, you might say, well, that, then it doesn't count for me, right? Because I don't obey all the commandments. But the good news, under the new covenant, we know that Jesus kept all the commandments for you. That's why that phrase, in him, is so important in that verse that I started at. That if we are in him, all the promises are yes. All right, so if you're in him, he kept the commandments for you. So you can, you can claim all the promises because you're in him. I am the Lord that healeth thee. Okay, so he is Jehovah God and he heals you. Now, he, you might say, well, he said that to the Israelites as they were going through, just for the context, just so you know, as they were going through the wilderness, as they were preparing, basically, to go through the wilderness. He said, I am the Lord that heals you. And you might wonder, well, how, what, did he actually do that? And in Psalm 105, verse 37, it says, he brought them forth. This is talking about the same people, the, the children of Israel that went through the wilderness for 40 years. He brought them forth also with silver and gold, and there was not one feeble person among their tribes. Now, this might look like just a nice promise and an awesome thing that, that the Bible says, but don't underestimate the significance of this. There were, I would say, a modest estimate of two million people. When you think of the children of Israel going through the wilderness, you might think, well, there was a, a few hundred or maybe a few thousand. No, it was a few million. <laughs> a small estimate, a low estimate would be two million. I get that from, in Exodus, it says there were 600,000 men plus women, plus children, plus servants, plus there were a few Egyptians that went along with them, plus their cattle and whatever other animals. This is like a major city going through the wilderness. It wasn't just a few hundred or a few thousand. This was a major, this is like Fairfax County, I think, is 1.1 million. So it's like two Fairfax counties <laughs> on the low end, again, two million or more going through the wilderness and so th there were young people, there were old people, there were grandfathers and great-grandfathers and grandmothers, a lot of people, and there was not one feeble person among their tribes. Can you imagine that? So <laughs> I, I believe he kept his promise. There was not one feeble person, or the, he, he, he was the Lord that healed them because there was not one feeble person among their tribes. And we have the better covenant. There should not be one feeble person among our tribes, right? I mean, th this is this is a better covenant, and we should claim this. We should expect this. Hallelujah. In, in Exodus 23, it says, And you shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of, of thee. There shall nothing cast their young, nor be barren in the land, the number of thy days I will fulfill. This is an awesome passage of scripture. God, again, promising he's going to bless your bread and your water. So don't tell me bread's not good for me. He says he's blessing my bread. <laughs> he's blessing my water. And he's taking sickness from the midst, from the midst, the, the midst of me. And the number of my days he will fulfill. So he'll fulfill the number of my days Again, I like the fact that he's saying he will do this. It's not; it's his effort, not mine. I don't have to strive and worry a lot about my health and my longevity. He said he will fulfill the number of my days. It's in his hands, not mine. That takes the burden off of me. It, it makes life much easier when you know you don't have to worry about things. Let him do the worrying, and he doesn't worry. <laughs> Praise God, but, but it's, it's on him, not on me, to fulfill the number of my days. He'll do it. So healing, health, and wholeness promises are seen throughout the Bible. There, there's a lot of them in the, in the Psalms and the Proverbs. 
and I'll look at just a, just two or three of them. It says in Psalm 34, 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but don't put a period there, but the Lord delivers him out of a few of them, right? He delivers you from all of them. So the, the afflictions aren't from God. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but I don't believe those afflictions come from God. He's in the business of delivering you from those afflictions. Life itself will throw afflictions your way, right? Life throws all kinds of problems your way, but God is saying he's delivering you from all those. Hallelujah. And Psalm 42, 11, I've got this in the Webster translation. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Do you ever talk to yourself? This is David talking to himself. He's saying, why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. For I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. So like David speaking to himself, you can speak to your own body. You can speak to yourself. If your body is telling you that you're sick, speak to your body and tell, tell it to line up with God's word. If you feel... If you feel downcast or disquieted, as it were, as it words it here, speak to yourself, speak to your soul, speak to your body, speak to your mind, and command it to line up with God's word. It says, I will praise him. This is a, a key to how to overcome whatever the devil throws at you. Praise him. Spend quality time just worshiping him and praising him. And it's amazing how much that will benefit you. So praise him, who is the health of my countenance. He not only heals me, he is my health. He is the health of my countenance. Just like the, script, the scriptures that says he is your wisdom, he is your sanctification, he is your righteousness, he is your health. He is your prosperity. He is your, ex, your exceeding supply, the scripture says, abundant supply. He is everything that you need. So put your faith in him. Another one that you are probably familiar with, I might have touched on this last night, I don't remember, but bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his, benef his benefits. There are benefits for walking with God. There are benefits in this covenant that he has made with us. Two of them are mentioned here. He forgives all your iniquities. Has he forgiven all your iniquities? And it says he heals all your diseases. So has he healed all your diseases? That's just as true as, as the forgiveness of sins. It's just as true that he has healed all your diseases. The thing is, you need to believe this more than your doctor report. Now, I'm not telling you to not go to the doctor and not take it seriously, but you need to take God's word more seriously. Amen? He is the health of your countenance, and he heals all your diseases. And it tells us in Psalm 107 that he sent his word and healed them, and delivered them from their destruction. So we can see that healing is found in his word. In his word, he doesn't lie. In his word, it's, it's, it's all true. So he sent his word and he healed you. So you just need to agree with God. You need to proclaim life. You need to speak what God's word says about you. Declare, declare it boldly. Declare this boldly. <laughs> I shall not die, but live. And declare the works of the Lord. You know, whatever, again, whatever the diagnosis is, whatever the doctors tell you, this should be your bold confession. No matter how bad it gets. They may even say you only have a certain number of days or weeks to live, but you need to, to declare boldly, I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. And healing, health, and wholeness comes as we worship him. There's a scripture in Proverbs 3, verses 7 and 8. This is the amplified version. Be not wise in your own, own eyes. Reverently fear and worship the Lord. And I like the amplified because it, it translates the word fear as fear and worship because I think that's really the key to the, the Bible kind of fear is reverently worshiping the Lord. So it translates it that way. Reverently fear and worship the Lord and turn entirely away from evil, it shall be health to, to your nerves and sinews and marrow and moistening to your bones. Again, worshiping, whenever symptoms come your way, I believe you can do a couple of things. You can speak to those symptoms and command it to leave, 
Another thing you can do is meditate on the promises of healing. Another thing you can do is just spend time worshiping him. Spend time praising him and worshiping him and thanking him for his goodness and his grace and his abundant blessing. In Proverbs 4, this is another place that puts emphasis on the word of God. My son, attend to my words, incline thy ear into my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life to those that find them, they are health to all their flesh. So God's word produces life and health to all your flesh. Okay, so, so again, there, there's power in the word of God, there's power in worship. So partake of his word daily, meditate on it, saturate your soul in his word, and believe that his word, produce, believe that it produces life, and it floods your entire being with life. Another scripture that we could see where it promises healing is, it says, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken, broken spirit drives the bone. So another way that we can get health or our body to respond positively to the promises of God is by having a merry heart. And how, what's the best way to have a merry heart? The scripture says, in his presence there is fullness of joy. So spend quality time in his presence and you'll find joy consuming your being. So I shared with you a few promises from, uh, from some of the historic books and some of the, uh, the Psalms and the Proverbs. There are also a few places in the prophetic books that talk about healing, promises for healing. And it says in Jeremiah 30, verse 17, okay, so Jeremiah says, I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord. In Isaiah 58, 8, it tells us that then your light shall break forth like the morning, your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. Jesus is your righteousness, and he has gone before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. But again, it tells you that your healing shall spring forth speedily. If you're believing God for healing, if there's, is, if there's a physical condition that you're trying to overcome, claim this as God's promise to you that your healing will spring forth speedily. And then Malachi 4.2 says, But unto you who revere and worshipfully, worshipfully fear, Again, this is the way it's worded in the Amplified Classic Version. Worship fully, fear my name. Shall the Son of Righteousness, which is Jesus, arise with healing in his wings and his beams, and you shall go forth and gamble like calves released from the stall and leap for joy. So again, healing is provided. It tells us here from the Son of Righteousness that, that will arise and most people agree that that's prophetically speaking about Jesus. So those are some healing promises in the Old Testament, and we're in the better covenant, so we should be able to find some healing promises in the New Testament. Now, I'm only going to look at a few. There are, there are a lot of places in the Gospels. I, I did a sermon once on God's blank check. <laughs> there, are, there are seven places in the Gospels where Jesus basically gives you a blank check. He says, whatever you ask in my name, Whatever you ask the Father in my name, I'll do it. It's a, just a blank check. <laughs> I did a sermon on that a few years, a couple years ago, and I'll may do it again sometime. But I'm going to overlook those blank check scriptures and show the, that there are scriptures that are more specific than that. In Mark 16, 18, it tells you that you can lay hands on the sick. In fact, it's a command. It's part of the Great Commission that you're to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That's you in your hands. If you're a believer... Because in the context, he's saying this to those who believe. And you might say, well, I can't lay hands on the sick and they won't recover. Well, then it won't happen. <laughs> this is for believers, believing believers, not unbelieving believers. So if you believe this, it's true for you. If you're, if you're a believer, if you're born again and you believe this for yourself, claim it for yourself. I can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now, don't get disappointed if they're not healed instantly because I... You know, I fall back on this phrase, they shall recover. I know they shall recover, even if they're not healed instantly, they shall recover. And Luke 10, 19 tells you that you have this authority. Behold, I give to you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. 
and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Claim that as a promise, that you have authority over anything that's from the devil. Well, again, some people might, some people, as I mentioned earlier, there are some religious people that think that God puts sickness on people. Have you ever known any Christians that believe that? If you haven't, I'm surprised because there are a lot of Christians that believe that. But my question is, would you put sickness on your children? Would you, do, would you want your children to suffer from sickness or pain? And he's a much more, he, much more loving Heavenly Father, much more loving Father than any of us. Certainly he does not want to put sickness on his children. And so he's giving you the authority to take sickness away, take in, away any of the power of the, of the enemy. And if you're still not sure, John 10, 10, I think, kind of emphasizes what the source is because it says the thief, in other words, Satan, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. This is his will for you. He wants you to have life, abundant life. Sickness, disease, and chronic pain is not life. <laughs> That's not the abundant life, certainly, that he, that he desires for you. So, and there's, there's other scriptures, like in Hebrews 13, 8, where it says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And there's James 1, 17, where it says in him there's no shadow of turning. So if he was ever a God of healing and health and wholeness, he certainly is today, because he doesn't change. If it was his will to heal the children of Israel in the Old Testament, and he promised it to them, and there's promises like this in the New Testament. Since he doesn't change, not even a shadow of turning, the scripture says, that's still true today. And there's also James 5.15, which we're not going to look at. That's where it talks about the anointing of oil and the prayer, prayer of faith healing the sick. So there's, there's that scripture also. But I want us to look at 3 John 2 briefly. And again, we looked at this last night, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But this is just a one one more promise from the New Testament promises, promising you healing and health and wholeness and prosperity as far as that goes. Beloved, I wish above all things. This is God speaking. You might say, well, that was John speaking to some guy by the name of Gaius. But this is the word of God. This is God speaking to you. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. So this is God saying he wants this for you. He desires for you to be healthy. I see that as a promise. <laughs> All right, so let me briefly go through my third section. I want to talk about longevity promises. Not only does he promise you health, he promises you longevity. In other words, he promises you a long life. The first one, of course, is Exodus twenty twelve, where he says, Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. So he expresses his desire that you have a long life. And you might say, well, what if I didn't honor my father and my mother? Maybe I don't qualify. But again, all the commandments, he kept them for you. If you understand what the new covenant of grace is all about, it's not about you keeping all the commandments because he kept them for you. He kept them on your behalf. He did all the work and you receive all the, the blessings. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so this is, this is that promise. And here... In Ephesians, Paul quotes that. He says, honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with promise that you may, that it may be well with thee and thou mayest live long on the earth. So he promises you long life there. There's another scripture in Deuteronomy where he says, you shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you and that you may live and that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land that you shall possess. So not only does God want you to live, he wants, you, he wants it to be well with you, and he wants your life to be prolonged. Proverbs 3, it tells us that, he says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace they shall add to thee. Again, Jesus did all that commandment obeying for you, but you can still reap the benefits for what he did on your behalf. And so the, the long life and peace he wants to add to you. He, promise, he promises to satisfy you with longevity. I quoted this one earlier, so we won't stay on it, but he shall call upon me, 
and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. And the word salvation is a word that could have been translated healing. So he wants to satisfy you with a long, healthy life. Hallelujah. I remember years ago, Kenneth Hagin Sr. saying that uh, he said something like, if you ever see my name in the obituary, that means I'm satisfied. <laughs> so don't go until you're satisfied. How long is long life? Well, don't go until you're satisfied. And another scripture, Proverbs 9, 11, it says, for by me, by Jesus, actually in the context it's wisdom, but he is our wisdom, by me thy days shall be multiplied and your years of the years of thy life shall be increased. So by him or by wisdom, by Jesus who is our wisdom, our days are to be multiplied, our years are to be increased. Hallelujah. Do you believe all that? <laughs> so anyway, my, my point is there are a lot of scriptures that promise healing, that promise health, that promise long life. So what do I now that I know that, what do I do with that? Well, this is what we do with it. Well, I don't have it there. I thought I had one more there. <laughs> there should be one more. Well, do you see do you see first John five in there any, anywhere? First John five. I'll I'll read it to you. If it shows up, fine. If not, fine. <laughs> five well, you all bring bibles to, to church right <laughs> first john 5 verses 14 and 15 this is the confidence that we have in him do you want to pray with confidence the first thing you need to do to pray with confidence is to know what the bible promises and once you know what the bible promises now you can pray with confidence so this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will he hears you so are you convinced that it's his will to hear you, to heal you? If you're convinced, based on his promises, that it's his will to heal you, now we can pray with confidence. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions we desired of him. So my point is, now that I, now that I know that I know that I know that God promises healing, it's not just the stories about healing and the testimonies about healing but I know God promises it to me now I can pray with confidence and claim the healing for me and he's not a man that he would lie we already went over that God never intended for his children to be sick God never intended for any of his children to die prematurely in fact I would say we could we could make the argument that he never intended man to die period as far as going back to the days of the garden he never intended for us to suffer. He never intended for any of us to catch even a flu or certainly not COVID <laughs> or even a runny nose. That's not his will. So why, why does it happen? Well, sin entered in and along with sin came sickness. But the good news is you've been redeemed from sin and therefore you've been redeemed, redeemed from sickness. When, when you place your faith in Jesus as your substitute on the cross, you receive that gift of righteousness, part of the problem, I think, is a lot of Christians don't realize that they're righteous. They, they, they judge themselves and other people on their actions and deeds when God wants us to judge ourselves on the actions and deeds of Jesus that he did on your behalf. So Jesus conquered sin on the cross, and he also conquered sickness on the cross. By his stripes, you were healed. And you can have confidence now when you approach him and... You don't have to question, is it, is it your will to heal me? You don't have to question that. You can know that you know that you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, as they say, that it is his will to heal you. One way that healing manifests many times, when people get the revelation of what God has done for them and what Jesus did for them on the cross, there are numerous stories of people receiving healing as they take communion. Hi, I'm Pastor Ken Miller, and I'd like to invite you to Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church. We are a growing spirit-filled congregation here in Sterling, Virginia, boldly proclaiming God's glorious gospel of grace, the finished work of the cross, and Christ's overwhelming love for you. More information is available at abidinglife.net. Come experience the power of God's word at Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church.
Amen. He is the way maker. Amen. And that's what I praise him for. <laughs> he always makes a way. Even when it seems like there is no way, he always makes a way. Today is Flag Day. Happy Flag Day. Did anyone know that? <laughs> Happy Flag Day. It's another day that's important to some people. What's the other important day? No, that's next Sunday. That's next Sunday. So keep that in mind, children. <laughs> but the other thing is today happens to be our president's birthday. Did anybody besides me know that? <laughs> well, June 14th is also my grandmother's birthday, so, and, it, and it falls on Flag Day. So June 14th is something that I always remember. So when I learned that the president's birthday was on Flag Day, it's just easy to remember. So take some time to pray for your president. You know, he's under a lot of pressure. He's under uh, a lot of stress. I can't imagine. It's got to be the hardest job in the world. A lot, of a lot of attack, both physical and, well, not physical, physical, but, but in, in the culture as well as spiritual and probably mostly spiritual. So certainly keep him in prayer. All right, but today we're talking about the healing promises. The healing promises. You know, there, there's, how many of you have heard so usually a religious person say, when God answers your prayer, I've heard people say this pretty much all my life, especially when I was younger, God always answers your prayers, but sometimes he says yes, and sometimes he says no. The way I heard it was, sometimes he says yes, sometimes he says no, sometimes he says, the way I heard it was, the third option was wait a while. I've also heard maybe, but the main way I heard it, when I was a teenager, when I was first learning the things of God, um, and you know was born again and spirit baptized and trying to grow in the things of God. I was the Jesus freak back in my high school days. The, the church that I went to, and most Christians would say yes, no, and wait a while are the three options. So that was back in my teen, teen years, primarily, a couple years ago. So that made it difficult when, in, in the subject of healing, you know, I would hear healing testimonies and healing sermons, and usually they were based upon stories, they were based on examples on testimonies, either real-life testimonies, real-life examples, or scriptural examples, uh, like, you know, they might take blind Bartimaeus and build a sermon on that, or the woman with the issue of blood and build a sermon around that, and all that's fine, and I love listening to Andrew Walmack's healing journeys. Those, if you haven't listened to them, you really should. They're awesome. There's dozens of them, and some great testimonies, supernatural testimonies of healing in various people's lives. Those are all great and those are all awesome, but the question I had was, that's great for them, but how do I know, since God answers yes or no or wait a while, how, how do I know it's God's will to heal me? How can I be sure that it's his will to heal me? So that's why I want to share with you the healing promises. Not just I'm not going to spend time on the examples, although those are great sermons in themselves, today I want to focus on the promises because if you're like me, I, he I heard a lot of sermons about examples and testimonies, but I wanted to know, that's fine, but what does the Bible say about me? What is, I can't build my faith on an example or a testimony. I need to build my faith on a promise. So what are the actual promises of God about healing? And one thing I learned relatively early is 2 Corinthians 1.20, that all the promises of God are yes and amen. It says, yes, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. So all the promises of God are yes, and in, in, in him, amen. Now, I've got a lot of scriptures to share with you, and so most of them, <laughs> I'm probably, and I may end up not getting, getting to all of them, but most of them I won't spend a lot of time on, but... 
this is a core verse. If you, you know, if all the promises are yes and in him, amen, the in him part is very important. Because a lot of times you might feel like, well, I'm not qualified to receive that promise. There's something between me and God. Well, the only thing <laughs> that you need is to be in Jesus. If you're in Jesus, you qualify for the promises. So in the, that two-word phrase, <laughs> in him, is extremely important. So all the promises of God are yes, but not because you deserved it, but because Jesus deserved it on your behalf. And, and amen. Now, I like the way the English Standard Version words this. It says, for all the promises of God, for, for all the promises of God, find their yes in him. They find their yes in him. It's in Jesus. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. Now, I, I notice that about half the translations, I like to compare translations when I'm studying the Bible. I like to, you know, I, I love King James. Sorry, Thomas, but uh, <laughs> I, I love King James, but I know it's not perfect. And so I do like to compare translations. About half the translations pr bring out the fact that the amen, God says yes. The amen is something that we say. Okay, so no matter what God's plan for you is, it's not going to come to pass if you don't place yourself in agreement with it by saying amen. Not, not that there's any magic in the word amen, but the word amen just simply means so be it. And it's implying that you're placing yourself in agreement with God. So God says the yes. If you ask God for anything, if it's a promise in, the, in God's word, that's why we need to know what the promises are. Not just the examples of healing, but what are the promises of healing? And when you place yourself in, a, in agreement with what God promised, he says, yes, I say, amen. So be it, God. He promises healing for me. He promises prosperity for me. He promises protection for me. He promises guidance. He promises that I can hear his voice. He promises so many things. So who am I to say anything different than that? I just need to place myself in agreement with what he has promised. So... Again, I believe it's shaky to build your theology on examples or on stories or on testimonies. All those things are great, and they're, you know, the healing journeys and testimonies are great faith boosters, but your faith needs to be grounded in the promises of God. And, and another scripture that was helpful for me to, to know this and to know the character of God is that Scripture tells us in Numbers that he's not a man that he should lie. God is not a man that he would lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he not said, or hath he said and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? So God does not lie. <laughs> so this is another reason you need to know what the promises are. What, what did God promise me in God's word? Because I know God's not going to lie. There's another scripture very similar to that, or kind of similar to that in Titus, where it says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. It's just, I just wanted to share this because out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. There's more than one scripture that tells you God does not lie. Here it says he cannot lie. I, I don't think that takes any of us by surprise. We know God's not going to lie to us, but... but that should reassure you that if you find a promise in God's word, it's for you. God's not lying to you. So because of that, I went through the Bible and found the promises. Now there are a lot of, if you, beginning in Genesis, there, I didn't see anything that I would consider a promise about healing in Genesis, but there are certainly a lot of great examples which would be great sermons in themselves. But the first one that I found that I would consider a promise is Exodus 15, 26. And it says, and said, this is, this is God speaking, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and will do that which is right in his sight and will give ear to his commandments and keep his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Now this is the scripture I am the Lord that healeth thee. This is where you've heard people talk about Jehovah Rapha, or you might say Yahweh Rapha. The seven, there's what people call the seven, the seven covenant names of God, one of them being Jehovah Rapha. And that comes from here, if you were to look it up in the Hebrew. 
but it translates into English that I am the Lord that healeth thee. So that's a promise. And you might say, well, wait a minute. There's a big if there. I heard one person say the biggest word in the Bible is if. <laughs> and I've been taught another thing I was taught earlier in my life is that if you're going to claim the promises, you have to meet the conditions because there are conditions before these promises. And here there's a condition, right? If you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and will do that which is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. Can any of us say that we do that? But I've got good news for you. All the promises of God are yes in him. <laughs> in Jesus. Jesus lived that perfect life for you. Jesus came and he lived. He obeyed all the commandments on your behalf. He lived those 33 years without, without sinning at all. <laughs> he kept the law perfectly. And the scripture tells us repeatedly, and we've talked about this many times on Sundays, that we are in him. And if we are in him, we can claim we are co-heirs. We are heirs of God, co-heirs with Jesus. We can claim all the benefits of Jesus. Everything that he earned, and, you know, we fail over and over and over again, but he nailed our failure to the cross, and if we are in him, we can benefit from him being obedient. So Jesus did this for us. So keep that in mind when you see all these conditions, primarily in the Old Testament scripture. There are a lot of promises, but there's always a condition. And that's what throws some people off, or that's what, shakes people's faith sometimes they say they know that they're not meeting the condition at least in themselves but if you're in christ he fulfilled it for you we need to realize jesus did it for you he kept the promises or he kept the the law he kept the commandments he 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 did all this for you and that doesn't isn't to excuse you excuse you to you know to sin or to ignore the lord the lord's voice certainly not but we know that we're, we're all flawed in ourselves. But if we're in him, God sees us as righteous. That, that's so important to know that if you're in him, God sees you as righteous. Another thing people say is, well, yeah, but that was a promise to the Israelites. That's, that's not to the church. That's in the Old Testament. That has to do with the Israelites. The church can't claim that. But when we were studying Romans, we saw that we are Israel, right? We are counted as the seed of Abraham. We saw that in the book of Romans when we studied it. We, are, we can call Abraham our father. If we're in Christ, Abraham is our father, and we are counted as the seed of Abraham. We are counted, he says, he is a Jew who is not one outwardly, but one who is inwardly a Jew, circumcision of the heart, not of the flesh. So we can claim the promises that are given to Israel because we are counted as the seed of Abraham. Now, how was this fulfilled? You might say, well, did God always keep that, that promise? Well, let's look at one, one specific verse that kind of confirms that God's response to that promise. He brought them forth also with silver and gold, and there was not one feeble person among their tribes. Now, this is talking about the children of Israel going through the wilderness, and it says he brought them forth with silver and gold, so there was prosperity, and there was not one feeble person among their tribes, so there was health. Now, when you think of the children of Israel going through the Red Sea or walking through the wilderness for 40 years, I think it's easy to, if we don't really think about it, to maybe subconsciously in our mind think there's a few hundred people going through the wilderness or maybe a few thousand. This was a massive crowd. I've always said a minimum of 2 million. And I get that because it says there were 600,000 men plus women and children and servants. And it also, there's one scripture in Exodus that says some, some Egyptians left with them. So it was, it, was, it was a massive crowd. This was like a major metropolitan city going through the wilderness. You know, t think of all of the population of Washington, D.C. and Fairfax County going through, walking through at the same time through Sterling. 
It's, it's unthinkable. That's how big this crowd was, and that's on the low side. Two million, because they were growing in population. They had to have been, because they were having children. And these are our children, their parents, their grandparents, great-grandparents. This is a large crowd, and a lot of very elderly people, but it says there was not one feeble person among their tribes. I think that means God means what he says. When he says he's the God that heals you, he means he's the God that heals you. The next promise that I found was, Chapter 23, verse, going back to Exodus 23, verses 25 and 26. You shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water. So stop telling me not to eat bread because it's carbohydrates. He blesses my bread, hallelujah, and my water. This is getting closer. This is less than a month from now. Audrey Mack will be here. She is a graduate of Rama. Her husband's a graduate of Karis, and she's a frequent guest speaker at Andrew's conferences healing service on the 12th of November and the Sunday morning service on the 13th and what else YouTube of course connect with us there YouTube and Facebook if you haven't done that yet your name is beautiful Hallelujah. this is Pastor Ken Miller at Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church 10 Pigeon Hill Drive Suite 150 in the countryside area of Sterling Virginia I'd like to encourage you to join us Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. Again, it's Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church, 10 Pigeon Hill Drive, Suite 150 in Sterling, Virginia. Our Sunday morning service is at 11 o'clock. Join us in person or watch us live streaming on Facebook. God bless you. We were lost without you. We were dead without you. But you came into you changed our name we were lost without you from just outside our nation's capital from abiding life grace and faith church in northern virginia thank you for joining me for another edition of rivers of living water you can get information about this ministry at abidinglife.net feel free to send me an email pastor at abidinglife.net Sir, have your river, your crystal.